If you've ever poked around my channel or been here for any length of time, there is one thing that is very apparent. I love horror. Movies, shows, games, stories, all of it. And I love mixing it into a medium that presents as its natural opposite. There is so much that can go into the discussion surrounding horror, and there is a lot of psychology to unpack. But before you're able to dive into any of that, I think it's important to be able to understand and define just what horror actually is. When we think of horror, the first things that pop into our minds are more than likely images of frightful creatures with twisted limbs and gnarled faces, dead eyes shuffling in around an unsuspecting victim, a long arm reaching out of the shadows, their masked persona reflecting off the gleaming blade of the biggest knife in the kitchen drawer. Horror encompasses such a wide variety of imagery, and has blood to every reach of the imagination. But what is it that even the most differing portrayals have in common? Just what is horror, and why are we obsessed with seeking out the remnants of our instinctual responses? namely fear. In this segment, I'm going to be going over a general overview of what makes horror, focusing on the three main qualifications necessary. Tension, that serves as a technique to build suspense, and device is played to further captivating terror. Unrealism, the maintained understanding that fear is optional and comes with the ability to opt out of the experience. And relevance, the self awareness of the material to its current political and social climate. Horror hinges on fear. And before we can understand horror, we need to understand fear. By definition, fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or threat. Fear has played a key role in our evolution as a species. Without fear, Without those built-in alarm bells that ring up and down your spine at the sense of danger, we may have never rose above our ancestors to become what we are now. And although there is much less to be afraid of in today's world, those remnants still linger. From fear of the dark, an acknowledgement that what we cannot see can still present threats. To fear of being called upon to answer a question in class. A fear that if we get it wrong, we become ostracized from the group, removed from the pack. Recognizing fear is relatively easy. Your heart beats fast. You start to sweat and panic. You're overwhelmed with the urge to run, or shut down and freeze. Overall, it's not a pleasant experience. And yet, in modern times, there are those who have become fear junkies, constantly seeking out the next high. Why? What makes this undesirable emotion that signals undesirable situations so well, desirable. 
Well, it turns out, watching scary movies doesn't activate our fear response at all. According to brain scan research conducted by Thomas Straub at the Frederick Schiller University of Jena, the amygdala, the part of our brain responsible for our fear reactions, remains pretty silent during our favorite scary movies. Instead, four other specific regions of our brains get fired up. The visual cortex, responsible for processing visual information. Insular cortex, responsible for some primary functions, including perception, motor control, self-awareness, cognitive function, and interpersonal experience. The thalamus, regulating the part of our brain which controls sleep, consciousness, and alertness. And finally, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, which is a small part of our brain that is associated with planning, attention, and problem solving. So it's not exactly that primal instinctual fear necessarily that we're chasing, but rather something else entirely. A cocktail of responses stimulated through a very particular medium. And while our physiological responses give us more insight, and produces multiple theories, we still have no idea why we enjoy it so much. So let's take a look now at the genre, which everything hinges on. Horror. Horror stretches over so many mediums. Film, literature, video games. And, as time and technology progresses, it only gets more entrenched into every corner of pop culture. Since horror has such a wide reach, for the sake of this essay, I'll just be focusing on it from a film standpoint. In the early 70s, horror broke the mainstream with the astronomical success of The Exorcist, and then followed up later in the decade with Halloween, The Amityville Horror, and Alien. These films struck the industry and laid the foundations of movies to come. The Demonic, The Slasher, The Haunted House, and The Creature Feature, respectively. According to the New York Times, 1973 was the biggest year of the decade, bringing in $232.9 million. However, if you adjusted that number for inflation, it would make The Exorcist into a $983 million earner, and the numbers only continue to rise. 2017 was the biggest box office year for horror ever, with the success of It and Get Out leading the charge. With numbers like these, it's undeniable that horror is a huge staple in the consumption of our media, and it's here to stay. But now that we have some frame of reference of just how vast the genre is, Let's look at what makes the genre. What makes horror, horror? Despite what some might believe, it's not the jump scare around every corner, or the long panning shot of bubbling gore that hits the heart of horror. Rather, a piece of work requires three very distinct qualifications as laid out by psychologist Dr. Glenn D. Walters, to label itself horror. The first being tension. Tension employs the use of mechanics and devices which build suspense and further captivate terror. Quote, horror cinema's ability to induce and relieve tension and raise tension 
of a successful thought resolution is central to its appeal. The second being unrealism. This is the maintained understanding on the viewer's behalf that the fear is entirely optional and they possess the control and ability to opt out at any point during the experience. And finally, horror must possess relevance. Relevance being the material self-awareness to its current political and social climate. Looking at these qualifications a little more in depth, we first have tension. This is a thing that keeps you hooked, that keeps you on the edge of your seat, waiting to see what happens. It's not about the reveal, it's about how you get there. There are multiple ways to create tension on both the audio side and the visual side. Music plays a major role in setting the tone of a scene. Everyone knows that if they're in the middle of the ocean and two low notes suddenly drop, it's about to go down. Alternatively, the lack of the music paired with excellent visuals can be just as, if not more, dreadful. The sound of a character's footsteps shuffling down a long, dimly lit hallway amid the dead silence is an effective way to build suspense. There is no end to the way you can combine visual and auditory expertise to elicit specific reactions. A particular favorite of mine is from the 2005 spelunking horror, The Descent, which expertly films the movie in a very claustrophobic way, putting the viewer in the same point of view as the character shuffling through oppressively tight, dark tunnels in an unknown cave. The tension is created by forcing the viewer to gruelingly wriggle their way through collapsing rock caverns, along with our protagonists. The next qualification we have is unrealism. At first, it may seem a bit of an oxymoron, when the genre is always pushing how immersive experiences can become, but it isn't necessarily the believability which needs to be altered. No matter how immersed one becomes in a horror experience, there is always the understanding that the viewer is in control. In 1994, psychologist researchers Haight, McCauley, and Rosen conducted experiments on the psychology of disgust. During the experiments, they exposed college students to three documentaries depicting real-life horror. Ninety percent of the students turned the video off before reaching the end. Those who finished the tapes also expressed that they found them to be disturbing. Macaulay posed the question of why these individuals would find these images so unpleasant, when most of them had easily sat through horror films, which were much more violent and graphic. The answer he came up with is that the fictional nature of the films afford the viewers more control by placing psychological distance between them and the violent acts they witness. Having that understanding that the experience is controllable allows people to experience these situations in safety. One theory on why this is so appealing is the idea that horror films allow people to experience horrible situations without being harmed, affording them the ability to critically examine their own actions in this situation. 
after watching so many slasher films, you can begin to recognize the moment a character makes a mistake that marks them for death. And so you can internalize that action for yourself, allowing your chances of survival to go up should you ever face a similar situation. Another theory on why the controllable experience of horror is so appealing has to do with a large demographic which consumes horror. Young people have always been a major consumer of the genre. It's theorized that having the feeling of control in such an extreme circumstance, in a society that affords you little, is very enticing. Perhaps correlating to the desire and responsibility of adulthood, while still being societally branded as naive. This theory is also related to the notion that horror typically sees a spike during trying times, in which the state of things is out of the common person's hand. Which brings us to the final qualifying point of horror, relevance. Horror has always been a reflection on the fears we hold as a society. It has always maintained a self-awareness and an awareness of who is watching. It's important for the horror to be relevant, because nothing is more frightening than those things which control our lives, yet we have no control over. Nightmare on Elm Street arose from the mistrust of authority inspired by Watergate. Silence of the lambs praying on the emerging fetization of serial killer culture. Go back and watch the most popular films of the past few decades, and it's easy to see where the uneasiness within people lay as a whole. As mentioned before, 2017 was the biggest year for horror to date. Taking a look at one of the films which made this happen, it's easy to see how relevance comes into play. The film Get Out gained enormous popularity because it personified a dread and externalized everyday societal fear in a controllable way, while solidifying the validity of its audience in a tangible way. Also, the fact that this spike in horror consumption during such a tumultuous time is a correlation not to be missed. With incredible strife in political, social, and economic spheres, horror is there once again to provide a much-needed escape and validation for its viewers. I hope this has been able to provide you with some insight on the groundwork of horror, the foundations of which this fantastical genre lay upon. There are multiple facets of fear that this essay doesn't touch upon, including tropes such as the final girl or the vengeful spirit, subgenres such as slasher, psychological, aquaphobia, or even the varying mediums it possesses, such as video games, comics, creepypasta, to name only a few, as well as the popularity of horror in the ASMR community. Through readings or role plays, it's become a very interesting mix into a medium that's traditionally been aimed to relax. Just what is it that makes the two so deliciously interwoven? That's something I would love to delve into another time. In all, horror is a fascinating genre. It's a sandbox 
depths of imagination and instinct. It's immersive and provides an experience like no other. In whatever way it's presented, there will always be those who flock to it like vampires to virgins. Thank you for listening. I hope this audio has provided you with some new insights to consider, or at the very least, built upon your own established thoughts. If you have anything you'd like to add or comment on, please feel free to do so. Stay spooky, my friend.